I'd like to welcome our new sponsor, Couchbase. Couchbase is an open source, NoSQL document and key value store database. It requires no external cache, supports SQL and analytical queries for JSON data. Couchbase supports technologies like Kubernetes, Java, .NET, JavaScript, Go, and Python. Download it, give it a try at couchbase.com slash Hanselminutes. That's couchbase.com slash Hanselminutes. And I'll remind you that when you support our sponsors, you support this show. This is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Courtney Nash from Holloway.com. How are you? I'm well, Scott. How are you? I am very well. I am uh, working remotely, certainly, but I've been doing that for 13 years. But somehow the current situation, as we record this in March of 2020, I just feel somehow more remote. I feel farther away from people than usual. I think we all feel... I think it's a weird mix for me. I feel... I've been working remotely myself for um, over about 11 years now. And I feel more remote in some ways and almost weirdly more connected or maybe just attached to my phone <laughs> and Twitter, which maybe is not the same thing, I suppose. But um, more people are caring about and interested in how everyone's going to handle this. And so I, mm-hmm. I feel less alone being a remote worker than I did before. Um, so it's, it's a weird mix for me, I'd have to say. I'm hoping that the the empathy of the remote experience increases and that when everyone goes back, it won't be, they won't forget, you know, because we are, I've said this before and I I think I say it with, with love and people who are uh, differently abled will understand the metaphor, but when you are remote or the only remote in a entirely, let's all go to the office and sit together team, you are differently abled and they can leave the room and you'll be like, Hey, anybody on you? Oh, Oh, I guess you all left. And they just leave you there and you can't move. Um, they can't. See, you can't see them if they don't turn their cameras on. So you can't see if they're rolling their eyes at you. You lose a lot. Maybe now they will appreciate us. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Um, I've, I've always worked at hybrid remote kinds of organizations. Um, I've never been the sole remote person, though. Um, but I, I have a great deal of empathy for how much harder that um, must be. Um, more so than even at least if you have a band of other remote people um, and hopefully maybe a company that is aware of what that, you know, separation is like, um, then it's a bit better. But yeah, the, the, I I think there's no, there's far fewer sole remote people out there anymore after what's happened um, recently. And I agree that empathy, I don't think it's something people can forget after this, especially the thing I want to point out though, is this is not normal remote. I saw someone say, someone wrote something the other day that was, um, Folks, we're not working from home. This isn't W, you know, F H. This is W D P. It's working during a pandemic. It's, yeah, it it's, is definitely not the same. You, you, being forced to and having, you know, and choosing to are very, very different things. Yes. But I think so. that the benefit of all of this, as we said, is that empathy will be increased. People will start checking on each other and normalizing little kids wandering into meetings sometimes, and also appreciating that. Well, sometimes I've felt in the past people look at me working remote and they go, oh, man, you got a sweet deal. And someone, I mean, you mm. pick your kids up at school, you do this, you do that. And it's like, well, yeah, that is part of it. But then I also have that, maybe you've had this feeling, this remote worker low self-esteem where it's like, they can't see me, so they don't really know that I'm doing anything. So I'll work extra hard to make sure that I produce. and I oh, end up working more at night and more hours than I did when I was in the office. There's And there's data on that out there. Um, there's actually- is there? research on that. You know, there's a lot of anecdotal information. There's a lot of surveys of companies, you know, by companies who are remote. Um, and, and a lot of them have people report that phenomenon. Um, but my favorite example of this is, as, as I was working on researching this, the guide to remote work that we put out, there's two often cited studies that talk about the increased productivity of remote workers. Um, that are the closest thing to an actual controlled study, not just surveys or you know sort of uh, self-reported anecdotal measures. One is um, a Chinese uh, travel agency that sent half their workforce home to do book travel bookings, and another one is the U.S. Patent Office. And so it's patent officers who, uh, again, same thing. They sort of did a controlled study of patent officers working from home and approving patents and folks doing that 
in the office. And both of them reported, in some cases, sort of magical you know, productivity numbers, 20% more productivity from the folks at home. But the bit that got me when I really dug in and read the, the Chinese travel agency study is the quote unquote productivity numbers was just that they were actually spending almost an entire day more working collectively, you know, aggregated over the week. They weren't getting more done in the same amount of time. They were just working more because they were right. there. And that's the trick. So when I went 13 years ago to work remotely, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go home. I'm going to work maybe, what, 30 hours and then hang out. Mm-hmm. And that's not what happens. You don't like you could do that, but you always seem to find yourself working differently like that. And and I end up being I feel more productive because people aren't wandering into my office. I'm not getting interrupted or I'm getting interrupted differently. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's there's I, I, I miss the chatter. I miss the, the water cooler. And I think that that, you know, that adds me a half an hour, an hour a day. And then I think another bad thing about remote workers at home is we tend not to, uh, you know, we eat lunch at our desks a lot. There's not a lot of going out for lunch with the team, which yeah. can burn 90 minutes. All of the sort of care things that are built into an in-person environment, you know, so much of remote work is intent has to become so much more intentional, not just how do you communicate with people or how do you write things down or when and how do you meet? Um, but you have to be intentional then about all the, you know, I saw something somebody was mentioning where, you know, people are now doing something that staffs we're doing for them mm-hmm. if they went into an office, right? Office managers and, um, you know, heads of people or culture people or folks who made sure there are always snacks or whatever in your office. You're now the COO of your <laughs> home office. And if you're not thinking about what your quote unquote employee health is like, then well, no one else is doing it. Um, mm-hmm. And I had to get very intentional uh, about that myself as well. And I mean, I finally ended up getting onto a really specific gym schedule that worked with me and my family, but I would also make sure that I would always carve out time to sit at my table and eat lunch and not do any work, take the dog for a walk. And I would have to, I put these things on my calendar. I mean, I schedule them in and my whole team can see what I'm doing. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that that self-care aspect is something that's even more important right now and even harder to do. um, In this environment, you can't go to the gym. (laughs) Some people can't even go outside. Um, and so I think those challenges are really exacerbated right now. So you work for Holloway, it's H-O-L-L-O-W-A-Y, and this is a company that publishes comprehensive guides, right? It's a world out there where everybody can take their blog and I could take my blog and I could throw it into a remote guide for, you know, whatever. I can make a PDF in a couple of days and that would be Scott's Guide to Remote Work. Yeah. But Holloway is not that. I am looking right now at the Holloway Guide to Remote Work that you can pick up at holloway.com. You've got a huge amount of reviewers, contributors, contributing authors. This looks, this is not a blog. This is not a medium post. This is a 300 page researched book with editorial and uh, an appendix. It almost feels somewhere like close to uh, the level of effort that gets put into a, um, a Forrester, you know, report. This is, you put some work into this. Uh, <laughs> I, thousand, I, thousand links. I did. Um, I think the challenge right now about, talking to people about this guide is people now are like, yeah, yeah okay, I got it. You got a guide to remote work. That's great. I mean, it's the environment is in the tech universe at least, and all, is saturated with discussions and material about remote work. But we started on this uh, last fall. So we had published some other guides in, you know, sort of adjacent areas around startups and high growth companies, things around venture capital or hiring and scaling software teams. And um, I'd had this, I'd had, we had lots of topics we want to work on. And I basically said, we should do this um, last like September, October, full gut instinct, editorial kind of decision. (laughs) And, uh, and so, yeah, we've, we've, these things take a huge amount of time and effort to do. And when we started on this, of course, we had no idea what was going to happen now. But the goal with these guides that we produce ourselves versus other things, we are starting to publish other people on our platform, but we started with our own work. Um, It's kind of like a reverse Netflix. Like we did the fancy high-end stuff first, and then we're going to open it up to everyone else. Mm -hmm. But the premise, the initial premise at Holloway was so much, there's so much knowledge in the world and so much of it is sort of locked away and the internet doesn't really help you get to it. It's either in books, which are largely controlled by Amazon now, (laughs) um, like so many things. And it's not easy to discover and find things online. And anybody who's tried to Google something, I mean, try to Google coronavirus right now, there's so much information online, and it's so hard to wade through and figure out and find what's 
valuable and what's helpful. And so we thought, well, why don't we just start building those things? And so the the intention is to be very rigorous um, and to be as helpful as possible. And that means we don't want to present one single person or company's perspective, especially for very complex kinds of topics where there is there is no one answer and there certainly is no one way of doing things. But there there are a lot of, like you said, you know, sort of individual perspectives out there. And so we like to pull those together with as much research as we can find. And then, yeah, a lot of rigor around how that material is presented and evaluated and, and reviewed. Um, I have an academic background, um, quite a few of us actually <laughs> at Holloway do. Um, and, and a research background. So I think um, it sort of comes naturally to me, but there's not a lot of, of, of material like that out there for these kinds of topics. So hopefully, and the biggest thing for us is to be helpful. Like our, our, one of our biggest editorial principles is, is to be helpful. Um, mm-hmm. And I think having uh, very well-researched material is one of the more helpful things that we can do for people. So is this a guide that is a like sit down one and one remote work one one for the remote worker? Is it for the, the, C level exec, who's our audience here? That that are we trying to convince them or are we trying to enable them? We're trying to enable them. I can't convince you. <laughs> um, I can't convince anyone. And and I shouldn't. You know, prior to what just happened, I had a whole spiel about how companies need to really examine what works for them, um, what works for one company, and it's it's what stage it's at and what it's trying to achieve is very different than, you know, say like a GitLab, who's one of the more well-known all remote companies. But we've lost that choice now. Everybody's doing this. So our goal was always to enable, to give people information and to tackle some of the harder things. I think that for me, what happened when I started researching this was there wasn't a lot of information about like the really thorny, nitty gritty stuff. There's plenty of things there about how, you know, how to communicate asynchronously and how to set up your home office. But it's hard. Like, how do you hire people internationally? Um, What are all the tax laws? Like, what are all the... You know those kinds of things, um, and so we we went into all these deep pockets of the topic that are are largely or less so, you know, sort of examined. So the audience for this one's pretty broad. Mm-hmm. I think it's useful for sort of C level folks to get the landscape um, and to kind of understand the kinds of problems that uh, line managers and sort of departmental, you know, managers and folks are going to be dealing with. And also, again, like you said, to develop some empathy for the individual workers who are going to be in these positions. And so there's a lot in there for managers, teams, and individuals who are on those teams. I'd say that's really the, the core audience that we're looking at. There's also, like I said, there's some material in there for folks who are sort of HR operational, um, you know, like, holy cow. One of the, my f- the things that people say about remote work is you can hire someone from anywhere, but that's actually not entirely true. And it's really hard um, once you start sort of scaling internationally. We've got maybe 20% of the Microsoft developer division working remotely. Mm -hmm. And when people hear that, they're like, oh, that's amazing. That's fantastic. I'd love to work remotely from country. Right. And it's like, eh, you know, like, do I pay you in that? Like, how do I pay? Like, even just the, how do I pay you? Uh, How do I pay you is... Could be months of work, by the way. That's a book right there. <laughs> it is. Yeah, and and it, it, it you know pro tip, it's not just PayPal, and I can't just go and uh, yeah zoom some money over to you. So that's a challenge. Yeah. So um, we went there, yeah. you know. So like with those kinds of things, um, but we do have a bunch for people who are individual, you know, workers as well. Um, so mm-hmm. it's it's a pretty broad mix. I think there's a lot more for managers in there as well than I've seen. Um, more depth um, for managers. You know, Katie Walmersley, uh, one of the lead authors, is a veteran engineering manager. She works for Buffer, and she's been remote for pretty much her whole career. And the, you know, the folks that she talked to and the insights that she had around managing remote teams, um, there were things I learned from her and I've been doing this for a while now. So um, I think especially the things that are in there for managers are, are really valuable. One of the, the terms that I've used sometimes, I'm not, I think I made it up, was organizational willpower. And it, it's, my, it's when I get frustrated with a company and some, they don't do something. And I yeah. they say, why doesn't remote work here? And it's like, well, organizational willpower. I guess that's like buy-in, right? You need somebody to actually care at a higher level. You can't build it. I mean, can you do it from the ground up? Remote work? No. Everybody tells you you can do things like DevOps and whatnot from the ground up. And anybody who's tried to do even that will tell you how hard that is. Remote work to succeed requires buy-in at the highest levels of a company. And it doesn't just require buy-in. It requires empathy and modeling of, of those behaviors. Yes, and the modeling, the modeling. That's so important. 
Yeah. Um, there's, you know, people talk about culture. There's a reason everything you see about remote work talks about culture. Um, because, well, first of all, culture is important for any company. And I feel like what a remote envir- situation for a company is, is it pushes at all the hard spots of running a business and having people mm. have to work together. Um, I feel like it, it finds your weaknesses. Um, it's like having two-year-olds. They just oh, to find all the cracks, <laughs> right? And then just wedge it in there and keep pushing. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you don't, if you don't spend time explicitly thinking about your culture and whether it is set up to handle the kinds of challenges that a remote, um, a remote workforce has, that's going to be one of your biggest challenges. I believe firmly. <laughs> and if you don't have a set of values that support that, um, that are like very clearly articulated um, and regularly reinforced, then mm-hmm. it's, I think that's incredibly critical for leadership for companies who are doing this. No one wants to manage databases if they can avoid it. That's why MongoDB made MongoDB Atlas, a global cloud database service that runs on AWS, GCP, and Azure. You can deploy a fully managed MongoDB database in minutes with just a few clicks or a few API calls. MongoDB Atlas automates deployment, automates updates, handles scaling, and more so that you can focus on your application instead of taking care of your database. You can get started free at mongodb.com slash atlas. Now, if you're already managing a MongoDB deployment, Atlas has a live migration service. So you can migrate it easily with minimal downtime and then get back to what matters. Stop managing your database and start using MongoDB Atlas. So are you saying that if you have an unhealthy org and then you decide to move people remote, you're just going to have a nice big remote unhealthy org? And uh, you're going to, yes, you will have a nice <laughs> and it's going to get worse? <laughs> it's going to get worse is what I'm going to say. Yeah, fast. Interesting. So um, one of the things that we've been dealing with is that, you know, everyone was kicked out of their offices, right? So. <laughs> I've been doing my thing. And then suddenly in a day, there was like, go to the office, grab your monitor, grab your mouse and run. Right. Mm. And we are dealing with a, uh, not a very level playing field. We've got Wi-Fi people that people never thought about what it was like to be on Wi-Fi at home for eight hours. Or how about uh, their whole family on Wi-Fi at home for eight hours? Uh, we had a, a very nice young person who was, uh, had set up a home office in their, um, in their pantry. Yeah. Cause yeah, it was the only room. Have space. You know? Yeah, there's yeah. no space. Yeah, someone else had a um, laundry hamper flipped upside down, and they were at the end of the hallway, and they, <sighs> they just made the hallway the space, right? Yeah. All of these, and not everyone has the space or the privilege to go and make a spare bedroom. Like, I have a spare bedroom, and that's an office, and I filled it with toys. You know, it's full of Legos and crap, and the kids come in here, grab the Legos, and they come back out. But it looks pretty cool, and I, I the most important part is I have a door. Yeah, so do I. I have a dedicated office, and we're so privileged. See? We built, we bought this house because I was working remote. My husband works remote, and so we were able to. Well, partly, I part of the thing about the re- working remotely was we moved someplace cheap, and then you could afford a house. Not everybody has that. I mean, you you know, so you have people who are living in New York City and San Francisco, and they're jammed in there. And yeah, they certainly don't have the luxury of um, even a separate room and children running everywhere. <laughs> trying to do this in the in the kitchen. My wife always says when I when the door is closed, you know, I'm not available. Yeah. So when we originally started working remotely, I tried to express that I'm I'm remote, like I'm I'm away. Like consider the metaphor was I've gone to work. Mm. And that metaphor doesn't really work because I yeah. am here and they can hear me in yep. here. Uh so w- what do I do? Do I say do I give them access to my calendar? Do I put a light outside? And like right now I have I literally have a light outside that's like a <laughs> A smart I light. Saw you post about right? that. <laughs> so I just say, you know, set the daddy light to red, and uh, and that's working so far. But I, my kids are twelve. I don't know if that would work with a five year old. My five year old would be like, red light. I know what mom told me. Open the door. You know, and he, that's what's yeah. happened. I've had. What's to that just, red light about? I gave up. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I just stopped. I, I was having so much stress. I mean, and, and the folks I work with are, are. I mean, I'm the only parent, and they're working really hard to support me. Um, but. Uh, you know, I just, I was, I was so stressed out because I was like, you know, the kids have to stay out and I'm not, da, 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 da. And even though I knew in the back of my head, I'm always, I'm telling people in the guide, like, you, you know, let your kids in. It's okay. Let people see your life. And I just, I was like, well, I got to, I, they're just coming in and out now, even when it's my husband and I are sort of divvying up, trying to have like mornings with them and afternoons 
you know, each of us taking half of the day seems to be what's working for our structure because I have an eight and a five-year-old and the five-year-old can't self-entertain for more than, you know, (laughs) whatever, 15 minutes. Um, And when I just sort of threw open the boundaries and just started letting them in, my stress level went down, their stress level went down. Um, My team got to see even more really what I'm dealing with. Um, You know, and I had like one, the five-year-old came in and interrupted a conversation I was having with someone and he completely lost his train of thought. And I was like, yeah, imagine that like 10 times a day, buddy. This brings me up to another topic, which is I think there's a new flavor of professionalism, right? If you go back to what I was saying, I'm trying to create a office professional yeah, we're trying to recreate the office. Exactly. And I'm hearing that that's wrong. I think we shouldn't. And the more people I talk to, at least at what seems like fairly healthy, especially largely remote companies, mm-hmm. um, that's what I'm hearing. Just they, They've just embraced it. And I think that's a long road for a lot of the rest of America <laughs> and, and mm-hmm. the world in some cases, depending on how different cultures approach that. But for me, it's been, it's been very freeing. And it's, it turns out that, that if I'm less stressed out about it, um, they can come in, get a hug, and they know they're going to get the hug and they can go and we're fine. And then I'm not like yelling at my children to like get out of my office, you know? And the, the flip side is I have a job that is normally I need large chunks of focus time. Um, editorial work and, and software development have a lot of things in common. Um, and one of them is that you have to sit and spend time constructing and thinking or debugging and, and fixing. And I don't have that right now. A lot of the, the advice in our guide is about how to do deep work and how to set up your calendar. And like, you know, because we wrote it when we wrote it and now is now, I don't have any advice in there about this. But I think that's the biggest challenge for people is, and we're having to adjust um, our work styles and how much work we can do and what kind of work we can get done. And, and that's a lot to communicate with, you know, your teams or your managers. And so there's, that's the other big shift I think that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from just trying to work during a pandemic, a lot of people are finding, especially if you have family around um, that, and you don't have, and don't have a dedicated space or whatever, like we were just talking about, you just can't necessarily plan to sit and focus and think and contemplate. Um, and so we're having to learn how to work in, in very different ways. But I think the new professionalism is that we are humans who are in this unique situation together. And I hope that breaks down some of the um, cultural expectations we have about the office that are, in my opinion, just really outdated. It seems like for the, you know, I've been working for, what is it now, 30 years, and I've seen Mad Men, so really I've been working for 60 years, right? so I know that, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know how people worked in the 40s, right? That's exactly what it was like. Um, like you know, but it seems like finally for the first time, and probably only in tech, as you said, like tech kind of leads the, leads the cutting edge here, is we're recognizing that people are humans <laughs> and they're not resources. And if you're nice to them, they will do better work than if you're mean to them and burn them out. Yes. And now we need to take that from privileged tech West coast to East coast, to middle America, to the world yes. and be nice to people and I, let them prioritize their health and treat them with respect. You hired them. If they're like, that's the thing I think I'm seeing a lot of unfortunate things out there of, um, you know, sort of examples of, of horrible micromanagement and expectations um, which were bad enough if it weren't um, working during pandemic and with children at home. But the the office is um, the office is a hall monitor. The office is a built-in presence indicator, and mm. a lot of managers have always used that. <laughs> if they're not the kind, if I, I I'm just going to come out and say it. If you're a bad manager, then you're managing by butts and seats and trying to you know control what people um, are doing daily. And part of the nature of remote work that companies that are really have been doing this for a while is embracing is, is yes, hire people, hire smart people, um, enable them, give them clear goals, and then let them go do their work. Um, and you don't have to micromanage them. Um, and you don't have to, to know what they're doing every moment of the day. Right. See, that acknowledgement that they're grown. Like, how do you know that how do you know that they're at their desk? They're grown. Well, yeah. what if they? What if they're at the mall? Well, then I'll probably notice that their productivity is down and they won't work here anymore. Like they are adult humans that we hired for the job. We hired them to do the job, and so if you didn't hire the right people, <laughs> I mean, come on, uh, that's that's on you. Um, 
And so that that's, I think, trust, that trust is hard and, and companies are going to start seeing how little trust there is. And I think it's easy to sit and talk in the abstract about that. Um, it's very terrifying probably to be someone who's thrust into this and you're like, and I'm saying, sitting here saying like, you need a high trust environment. And they're, and they're like, mm-hmm. well, I don't, I don't have one. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a good answer for that right now. That you can't just be like, tell your you know management team to go build some trust. Like That's the thing. And it's a constant up and down. It's not bottom up. It's not top down. And, and it is modeling as well. My, uh, like if my VP is offended when my son jumps in to my lap, then and 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 feels that that's unprofessional, but uh, the, and and then that that isn't reciprocated. That I'm going to feel like, oh well, gosh, well they're not modeling that behavior, therefore this is not good for me. Like it mm-hmm. has to go multiple ways. Yeah. So when I look at the depth of this, it is overwhelming. You have managing distributed teams, being a successful remote worker. These are the kinds of things that we've seen in other guides. But then you go into legal, tax, operational concerns. You go deep into working together around communication. One of the things that I was really impressed with that I'd never even thought about was handling urgent issues across remote teams. Hmm. The idea of like, well, if I can, I can just, I'll just slack them, right? I'll just call them on teams. Just like, right. hey, you busy? You busy? Hmm. You yeah. actually go through creating what's called an incident priority matrix, which is the like <laughs> flow chart. Do you bug me or not? Yeah. You have to have that. You have to, because you can't see what someone's doing. You don't necessarily know what's going on. And part of the premise of why remote work is so great is that we don't have all of these other distractions of, in an office. We don't have open office plans and people chatting and dropping things and playing. I mean, we have new distractions at home, many of which we've already just discussed. Um, but what's the point of being able to, in theory, you know, turn everything off, sit and try to get your work done if somebody's like, you know, hey. Hey, are you there on Slack? Because then it's, now Slack's the new distraction technique, right? Or Teams or whatever. And so you like everything else with remote work, you have to be explicit about how that works. You have to talk to your team about it. What a, what a exactly. thought. How do we communicate? What is urgent? If it's not urgent, when when should I expect you to get back to me? And, and, and if it is urgent, how, who, who does what and how? And uh, I just had a conversation about this with someone from my team because I got a migraine last week and I slacked the team like, hey, guys, I got a migraine. Um, I don't feel great. Hey, y'all. Actually, I'm trying not to say guys, which is like so frustrating when it comes out. And I got to go. I got to go lay down for a while and chill out. And they were like, mm-hmm. OK, great. And then we had a meeting on the calendar later that day. And they were all like, is, is Courtney coming or is she, is she not coming? And they didn't know. Mm hmm. And so in that case, it was, I didn't make it seem like quite as serious it was. And what I should have done was sort of texted some folks and been like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go disappear for like three hours because the Slack message just disappeared. Uh, you know, and people, some people saw it, some people didn't, it wasn't clear. And so that's like a perfect case of like, what's the escalation in that case? And so now we're going to have one for that, you know? You teach people how to treat you. I've said this in my productivity talks that like, if you answer email at two in the morning or on a Sunday, you've taught everyone that you do that. Yes. Right. So if migraines are a thing or my diabetes shuts me out of a meeting or two Mm -hmm. because of whatever reasons, then I need to think about that flow chart and make it as simple as possible for both me and they to know, like, do we call the police, text Scott's wife or just he'll be there late? Right. There's there's, there's escalation there. And that's a really important thing. And that gets back to the whole we are humans. So Mm -hmm. let's just be conscious of everyone's situation. Let's just be real. You and I, before we got on this podcast, (laughs) I emailed you and I said, I'm having some trouble with the kids. It's chaos. Can I be about five minutes late? And you were like, oh, my God, I I was going to text you the same thing because you were running late as well. And and the show still happens and it's still a great show. And here we are. Um, and here we yeah. Are. So, but thank you. I, I think I joke with uh, one of the one of the lead authors um, is uh, Juan Pablo Burdica, who used to work at uh, Stripe. He was working at Stripe while he, or, while he was still sort of writing some of this, and then he um, moved on from there. But uh, he I, he had to write what email is. Like he had to write a very big like because that's kind of how we do it. We don't presume anything, right? Um, we try not to presume you know any specific knowledge um, on anyone's part. And so if we're going to try to explain what asynchronous communication is, we're also going to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what email is. And so we, you know, so we, yeah, we go down to this level of depth of like, here's the really practical, like hands-on kinds of things that you may not have, have ever thought about. And, and I mean, you were, like bringing up email is a great one and, and modeling of those, we have all this explosion of tools we can use now to work remotely, right? 
Um, we have Slack and Teams and Zoom and Hangouts. And, and I'm maintaining this database of, of remote company tools. And every day I find like three more. It's, it's very hard to keep up now. And imagine that, right? As you're either a manager or you're a, an individual person, you're like, how, how do I even wrap my brain around which one of these I should use? And there's a lot of talk about like tools for remote work. And we kind of reverse engineered that and tried to start from first principles, which is how do you need to communicate? What do you need to communicate about? And how does that differ across different kinds of scenarios? And then sort of build up an architecture of the ways you communicate and things you use to do that. And then again, part of the sort of communication or you know protocol matrix, write it down. So that way everybody mm-hmm. knows. It's it's not it's not unclear. And yeah, so kudos for the folks who are writing this stuff too, because it's it's not a way that you're a lot of people are used to writing. You kind of write some stuff you know, and then you move on. And I we had to spend a lot of time going, wait, what do you no, we have we have to clarify that for people. We have to be very explicit what that means. Um, we can't leave anything to be confusing or unclear. Mm-hmm. So that's why it takes a while to do these things. Well, folks can check out the uh, Holloway Guide to Remote Work at holloway.com. That's H-O-L-L-O-W-A-Y. It is an extraordinary full-on book online with a really amazing reader. It's uh, read online and a really interesting piece of software. This is not just an infinite scroll through 300 pages of, of stuff. And you can go and check out all the links. There's almost uh, 900 links within it dozens of contributing authors, and it is very highly edited and really extraordinary. And I appreciate that you all put it out early during these unusual times that we're in. Yeah, that was a, I mean, we, like I said, we started on this thing and thank you. And and huge praise to our sort of product and engineering team who have have built what I think is a really like delightful reading experience online. We were conflicted about whether to release it early, to put it out, um, to promote it, um, (laughs) But people kept coming to us and saying, you've got to do this. Like, this thing's super valuable. It actually is helpful. Um, It goes well below the surface. So I'm I'm continuing to fight my instincts because I don't want people to feel like we're trying to capitalize on a crisis. No, I definitely don't. There are businesses that are capitalizing on a crisis, but then there are ones that are putting out useful information. And I think that this is useful information. And that's why I wanted to chat with you. Well, thank you very much. I'm so excited to finally get to, to connect with you. All right. I've been talking with Courtney Nash, and this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.